With respiratory alkalosis, alkalosis refers to a process that causes alkali accumulation or acid loss. And respiratory refers to the fact that it's a failure of the respiratory system carrying out its normal pH balancing job. Now, normally during an inhalation, the diaphragm and chest wall muscles contract to pull open the chest, and that sucks in air like a vacuum cleaner. Then during an exhalation, the muscles relax, allowing the elastin in the lungs to recoil, pulling the lungs back to their normal size and pushing that air out. Ultimately, the lungs need to pull oxygen into the body and get rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide binds to water in the blood and forms carbonic acid, which then dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So in order to prevent pH fluctuations, the carbon dioxide concentration or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, called PCO2, needs to be kept within a fairly narrow range. For this reason, the lungs maintain the ventilation rate they need to get rid of carbon dioxide, at the same rate that it's created by the tissues. If PCO2 levels start to fall and pH levels start to rise, peripheral chemoreceptors that are found in the walls of the corroded arteries and in the wall of the aortic arch start to fire less. And that notifies the respiratory centers in the brainstem that they need to decrease the respiratory rate and depth of breathing. As the respiratory rate decreases and breaths become more shallow, the minute ventilation decreases, which is the volume of air that moves in and out of the lungs in a minute. The decreased ventilation means less carbon dioxide moves out of the body, which increases the PCO2 in the body and lowers the pH. In respiratory alkalosis, the normal mechanism of ventilation gets disturbed, and the minute ventilation goes higher than what's needed to balance the pH. For ventilation to increase, the respiratory centers have to start firing more than usual. This increased firing might be a normal compensatory response, or an abnormal response to a situation that doesn't really call for increased ventilation. Increased ventilation is a normal response to things like hypoxia, which is a low oxygen level that happens with diseases like pneumonia or a pulmonary embolism, or even when a person climbs a high mountain like Mount Everest. Increased ventilation, though, can be an abnormal response that sometimes happens in situations like anxiety and panic attacks, as well as in sepsis or in overdoses with salicylates. Rarely, brainstem disorders can irritate the respiratory centers and make them fire more. Sometimes increased minute ventilation is iatrogenic, meaning that it's a result of a medical intervention. For example, a person might be intubated and on a ventilator. If the ventilator settings aren't correct, it can cause a respiratory alkalosis. In all these situations, the result is that the lungs get rid of too much carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide gets depleted from the blood, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide falls, usually below 35 millimeters of mercury. This causes an increase in blood pH, often raising it above 7.45. To compensate for this increase, the body has designed several mechanisms. First of all, minutes after the onset of respiratory alkalosis, acidic molecules from within the cells, especially red blood cells, like exposed carboxyl groups from proteins like hemoglobin, give off a whole bunch of hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions diffuse into the blood, where they grab bicarbonate ions in order to form carbonic acid, which will eventually break down to carbon dioxide and water molecules. This leads to a slight decrease in the plasma bicarbonate concentration, which is the main alkaline molecule in the blood. The concentration of these intracellular proteins, though, is too low compared to the amount of bicarbonate floating around in the blood. So essentially, only a limited amount of hydrogen ions are available to bind and neutralize these bicarbonate molecules. As a result, most of the time the decrease in free bicarbonate ions is too little to have a substantial effect on pH since it's only about 2 milli equivalents per liter for each 10 millimeters of mercury decrease in partial pressure of carbon dioxide. As an example, if PCO2 has an acute drop of 20 millimeters of mercury, let's say it moved from 40 to 20, then this mechanism could only decrease plasma bicarbonate by 4 milli equivalents per liter, from its reference value of 24 to 20, which does not have a big impact on the pH. Therefore, the pH remains high during this acute phase of the disorder. 
Fortunately, within about three to five days, kidneys start sensing that pH is too high and step up to help correct the imbalance. More specifically, the major way they do this is by making the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule decrease reabsorption of HCO3-, so it's being excreted more in the urine. In fact, the kidneys are pretty effective in doing this, since they manage to decrease the concentration of bicarbonate about 4 to 5 milliequivalents per liter for each 10 millimeters of mercury decrease in PCO2. So just like before, if PCO2 went down from 40 to 20 millimeters of mercury, Plasma bicarbonate this time would decrease by 8 milliequivalents per liter, from 24 to 16. This can lead to a substantial decrease in the pH, bringing it closer to its normal range again. Alright, as a quick recap. Respiratory alkalosis happens when lungs blow off more carbon dioxide than needed, which causes blood pH to increase above 7.45. It can be divided into an acute and a chronic phase, according to the absence or presence of renal compensation, respectively, which decreases bicarbonate concentration in the blood.